Paul Gray from The Damned. It's good to see we're going to be seeing you back in Australia. We just had you down here just recently. So, you know, this is two uh, visits in quick succession. You must, you must have enjoyed it last time, Paul. Loved it. My first time to Australia. Yeah, never been there before. All my friends have been there, loads of friends, said, got to go, fantastic. But I, I thought, oh, how good can it be? But absolutely loved it. So, yeah, can't wait to get back. So you had such a good time when you were here last time that you rang Rat Scabies and said, mate, you need to come with me this time. <laughs> you don't want me this one, pal. Come on <laughs> down. Yeah, something like that. So this is uh, pretty exciting stuff because uh, Rat hasn't been with the band for 35 years. Um, you, you know, like when we look at the lineup of you and Rat and Captain Sensible and uh, Dave, uh, there's quite the nucleus of the band there. And I mean, I'm not disregarding uh, Monty at this point because he's almost been with the band for 30 years as well. He certainly has, yeah, longer than yeah. I have. But is, is there a particular formula when, uh, you know, the four of you guys come together? There's an organic formula that is just totally natural. Um, and I was having dinner with Captain last night um, after the second day's rehearsal. And it was kind of like, it's become kind of what it was back 35, 40 years ago. It's got that kind of nice raw garagey, anything can happen feel to it back, which is really, really exciting. Um, there's just something about, I mean, I, I've worked with Rat five over the last, what, five, six years with a band called Professor Madman, uh, some guys from Orange County in California. And we've done it remotely, we record our stuff remotely. And I put my bass on after Rat does his drums, which is normally you do it together or, you know. Um, but it, it, Rat and I have got this thing that we just kind of seem to anticipate what each other are going to do mm. um, and do it kind of exactly the same time. And that's not changed since the last time I actually physically played with him in a room and with, and with Captain too. So, you know, it's one of those kind of unquantifiable things that, just kind of works without you really knowing how it works. It's just, you know, you've got that natural spark between us. When uh, the damn tour to Australia last time, I spoke to Captain Sensible and I actually talked to him about his solo work and asking him <coughs> what was going to make it into the set list. And, uh, you know, he seemed a bit like, oh, I don't, don't know about that. But it has popped in a few times over 2023 now, hasn't it? Well, the short answer is we don't know what's in the set list yet because we've been going through a whole raft of songs over the last two days. Today's the last day, we've only got three days. So the aim is we kick off at midday today, we go through all the songs that kind of sound the best, then hone them into 90 minutes, run through them twice today, then that will be it. But we've got some standbys as well. So we'll kind of see how it goes. I think we've got enough, well, we've got more than enough, way more than enough to kind of change the set about a bit, you know, according to how we feel and how the audience is. So it's a it's a luxury catalogue of songs that we can dip into. But there'll be ones that people will probably expect us to play and maybe some ones that people won't expect us to play. Doesn't we'll have to cool. say, I don't know yet, I'm the bass player. <laughs> <laughs> There's a couple of songs along the way that other people have covered and, you know, had very much success with, like New Rose, Guns N' Roses, and uh, Smash It Up, The Offspring. Um, because they've taken those songs to another generation. Are you compelled to put those songs automatically into a set list? We have to play them. They're part of the dam's DNA. You know, without those songs, the, the dam wouldn't be here, really. You know, it all goes back to that kind of little seed that the songs that Brian wrote all those years ago. And they're still great fun to play. You know, they're less than three minutes of, of complete, you know, snappy garage rock and roll. So... They'll, ne they'll never go. You know, they'll always be in there. What about a song like We've Got to Get Out of This Place, the Eric Burden and the Animal song that you've been covering? I'll tell you what happened there. That was in America somewhere. And I'd gone off stage. I mean, at the end of the set, and our tour manager came on, for some reason picked up the bass and started playing a few bars of it. And Dave and Captain were still lurking on the stage and they joined in. So they got about 20 seconds of it. So... <laughs> Is, isn't, 
isn't the internet wonderful where it can document that the band does something like that and it becomes a matter of fact history? It will be on video somewhere. Yeah, probably. Yeah, yeah. Well, at, that, at that point where you just walk off and come back on and there it is. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, tell me about your side project, The Wingman. Uh, Baz Warren, who we uh, had down here recently uh, with I, the Stranglers, um, yeah. he's he's a part of that as well. Was that a one-off? Is there going to be more of that? What's the story with that band? No, it, it's another organic bubbling away project. I mean, that very quickly, that came about through lockdown. Uh, the drummer, Captain and I have got a, a side band called The Sensible Grey Cells uh, for the more kind of maybe poppier um songs that aren't suitable for the damned. We have a drummer called Marty Parrott, and he phoned me up beginning of COVID and said, you know, we're really bored. Any other guitarist would you like to play with? So I said, Lee Hegarty from a band called Ruts, Ruts DC. So he phoned up Lee, said, yeah, I'd love to do it. No only singer. He said, well, that's Bass from the Stranglers, but he's pretty busy. So he's not busy now. We've got bloody COVID. <laughs> so within three, well, within a day, we had a band um, so I sent Baz some songs that I had. He came back a week later with some incredible lyrics and vocal lines that I would never think of, some guitar parts and them, sent to Lee. He edited his guitar. So we ended up doing a whole album. It was just something to do, but it ended up being this album that we all contributed to. The record company wanted to put it out. We did a tour beginning of last year in between all other band projects, and it was an absolute blast. So... Um, we're continuing writing, we're pinging ideas from to and fro all the time. So there'll be another tour, not this year, because we're busy, the strands are busy, probably next year. So it's a really nice, fun, low-key side project with some really lovely people. You never seem to have been out of work. You've got this fascinating history when I look at everything you've done over the years, including that uh, one and only uh, album by Andrew Ridgely, uh, Son of Albert. Bringing that up. <laughs> How much of that were you involved with? I did two tracks on it. It, it was a funny story. Um, a friend of mine worked in an advertising agency in London, and one of the guys that worked there was a session player playing guitar on Andrew's album. Um, and Sony had given George Michael a shed load of money after Wham's bit, and I gave Andrew a shed load of money. So he said, let's go and do a rock album. And he said, do you know any rock, rock bass players? So um, my mate said, oh, yeah, Paul from, uh, I just left UFO then, which is pretty rock. Um, so they said, well, come up the studio and let's see what you can do. So I came in a studio, went up the studio a couple of days later, and there was nobody there, but the desk was strewn with, like, Enough's Enough and ACDC and Def Leppard. I thought, I'm in the wrong bloody studio here. This is wrong. So I went out to the going reception, said, no, no, no. That's Andrew's studio. Anyway, they all piled in. Um, played bass in a couple of tracks. They said, yeah, great. Do you want to come to Japan? So I ended up going to Japan and doing all these videos and TV shows with them. Um, and I've got to say, it was real fun. You know, it, it wasn't massively taxing musically, um, but it was nice to get wine and dine at Sony's expense and see how the other half live in, in, in Tokyo, you know, and... Another thing I can put down is a pretty wild and wacky thing that I would never have thought I would have done. Yeah, yeah. Another wild and wacky thing, well, you know, very musical thing, the Johnny Thunders album, So Alone. When I look at the lineup on that record, it's just gobsmacking, isn't it? You've got uh, Phil Leonard of Thin Lizzy, Steve Marriott, uh, Paul Cook and Steve Jones of the Sex Pistols. Chrissy Hind was on that record. It reads like an all-star cast, but what was it like recording that record? They were, they were never there. Um, the, the, all the tracks, we had, Johnny, um, Steve Nichol, who was the Hot Rods drummer, myself, Johnny really loved the Hot Rods and we, we really loved the New York Dolls. Um, and the, we had a photographer friend at the time, Michael Beal, who took photos for the Damned and the Heartbreakers and the Hot Rods. So he kind of did the introductions and Hot Rods manager, Ed Hollis, knew all the people around Johnny. So, when the Heartbreakers split, um, Johnny said, you know, let's let's get Steve and Paul down. So we ended up doing the whole album over about a month because Johnny, bless him, he was good for about an hour a day. You know, between midnight and 1am, he, he was just about okay to play. 
after one aim he was useless before midnight he wasn't around mm. so you just kind of grab those moments quickly um so he didn't hold an album and his manager um i think he wanted to put in a bunch of names to help set it so he got a lot of other people down um that weren't there when me and steve were recording but i did some other stuff with mike Kelly, who was the drummer in the only ones and spooky two before that um pete parrot was there uh, the two new york girls patty padded in um so i ended up you know quite a a lot of people playing on it, but not necessarily at the same time. But I'm immensely proud of that record. There's some great songs in it. And, you know, he had his faults and problems, as we know, but he, deep down, he was a really shy, very insecure, lovely guy. At one time, also, you were a member of The Members, who they actually had a top five hit in Australia with a song called Radio. I think you'd be departed by that stage. Um, you weren't on... I did one tour with them. One tour? Yeah. Yeah, that they supported uh, my band, Eddie and Hot Rods. And at the end of it, their bass player disappeared, shall we say. Um, and they had another tour of their own headline tour of Britain starting. So they said, will you step in and play bass? I said, yeah, sure, because that lovely guy's got them really well. Very different for me because it was more sort of finger-type bass playing and, you know, quite a lot of dub reggae stuff. But it was really good fun to do. Mm. So I did that one tour. Um, I'm still in touch with JC. Um, in fact, he did a, the support tour for Wingman last year, which was a nice kind of full circle after 40 whatever years, 45 years, you know. Well, Eddie and the Hot Rods, as you mentioned, had a number of hits in the UK. So when you joined The Damned, you already had not only a history, but a very successful history. Successful, but not lucrative. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, was in a, I, I joined Hot Rods when I was 16. And that was it. I spent the next five years living up as much as you would do when you were 16, 17, doing all that stuff. So it kind of went by in a bit of a blur. Um, and we didn't stop working. You know, we toured and we toured and we toured and we toured and we toured. Um, and I mean, but what a way to start your career, you know, in a in a band like that. Mm -hmm. um, so I always loved the damn no. They were one of the few bands I'd, I'd actually go and see back in the day, the, the Damned, the Stranglers, Bagel Hemsworth, Gorillas, wasn't so much into the rest of the punk stuff, but the Damned I always loved and, and the Stranglers I always loved. So I've kind of ended up working with both really in a way, you know. Hmm. How, how fab is that? <laughs> when uh, this tour was announced, it seemed to be a very limited number of shows. That's been expanding out, hasn't it? There's a whole US tour and a whole UK tour that's come off the back of this. Yeah, it, it, we didn't know really um, how many, what, what the offers might be or how many shows might come in. Um, so every kind of couple of weeks, there's a few more being added, some more festivals. So it's, it's very, very exciting, especially after the last two days. A little bit deafer, a little bit more tinnitus, um, but it, it's, you know, it's, it's great to have the bunch of us playing back together again. So... You know, I think hopefully us is in for a bit of a treat. I know we are. So you're not using the name uh, Farewell or uh, Last Ever or anything like that? This isn't the last time for the band, is it? It's the damned. Anything can happen. Hmm. I mean, that's the best I can say. Hopefully not. Um, whether we get to Australia again, I'd, 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 I'd love to. I mean, we'll see how it goes. Yeah, well, we've had you two times in as many years, so lucky us. Um, yeah, oh, thank you. And we look forward to this one, with the point of difference uh, being that you're coming with uh, Rat Scabies uh, back in the yeah. band for the first time for 35 years. That makes it uh, rather special. Paul, been great to catch up with you. Uh, pack your bags, get ready for Australia, and we will see you in just a few weeks. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. Nice one. Thank see you, you then.